this last week, um, I read an article, and it kind of encapsulates what we're talking about today. It was an interview, actually. Um, there's a well-known female athlete, and she was uh, playing in her final game, and then she tore her uh, Achilles in the last game before she was going to retire. And she made this comment in an interview, and I thought, that's it. That, that is exactly the tension that so many people find themselves in, and they wrestle with this idea when they try to see God through the lens of their experience right here in life. Right? And this is actually what she said afterwards. She says, I'm not a religious person or anything, and if there was a God, this is proof that there isn't. Like, she's experiencing this pain, this frustration, this anger, but... She's looking at that saying, well, obviously then God doesn't exist. She's using pain as an argument about against God's existence as a whole. And you probably, and I mean, you've probably been around people, maybe you've even said this before, you're like, I don't know, like, this shouldn't be this way. It's, it, it's not right. It's unjust. It's, it's wrong. I didn't deserve this. And you start to ask those big questions of, well, where is God now then? How, how can he not come in? To my defense, how come he's not stepping into my circumstance and my situation if there is truly a God? This essentially is the primary logic when it comes to this mindset that we have. Um, if God is just and good, then why is there so little justice and goodness in a world he created? When you look around the world, it is not hard to find injustice or pain. I mean, it's everywhere. You turn on the news and it's immediate. It's perfect. You look at the newspaper or your news feed on your phone or whatever. Immediately, you're inundated with negativity. You're like, oh my gosh, nothing is right. Like, there's little right in the world. The only thing right is like the person next to me I have a relationship with. Everything else out there is just like wrong, 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 wrong. We see it all broken, right? And this is kind of where it leads to. If this is really what you're wrestling with, or maybe somebody else you know is wrestling with this or said this, it kind of leaves you with just a few options only. First one, that God isn't able to address my circumstance. That yes, he exists, but he might not be as good or as big and powerful as they say he is, because he's obviously not doing it, something about this injustice, so he's not able to. B, God isn't good. Like he, he might be able to, but for whatever reason, he's choosing not to, and if, if, a, good, if a good God existed, he wouldn't allow there to be injustice. He wouldn't allow this evil to be in his creation. And if you wrestle with this long enough, you kind of end up moving in the direction of season. Well, I, I guess God doesn't exist. Because this is so hard to wrestle with over time that eventually you're just like, I just guess, I, I don't have to understand how that would make sense in my world with what I'm seeing, with what I'm experiencing, with the headlines that I'm reading. So I guess, I guess God just doesn't exist. And I promise you this, you know people that have gone down this road. Maybe you are partially, partially down this road. It's exactly why we're having this conversation, because I think, I think it is a work, com worthwhile conversation to have. We've talked about this in the past week. There's an incredible amount of people in the last couple decades that are moving away from faith. 40 million people in the last couple decades that used to go to church once a month don't go to church at all anymore. This is a movement. It's the biggest shift as far as our religious culture in America, in the history of America. It's the biggest shift in that culture that we've ever seen. It is a massive movement. The, the problem with this, like wrestling, and it's okay to wrestle. I want you to ask questions. I think it's important that we ask questions. But sometimes when we're looking for evidence for this, we commandeer other people's stories. We look around and we're like, well, that person's hurting over there, and that's not right that that happened to them. And look at their story. Oh, my goodness. They're such good people, and yet this is happening. i got to give you pause right there because this is really important. Sometimes we commandeer other people's stories of pain and use them as excuses for us to step away from God. But in reality, if you actually talk to the people, the moment in their greatest amount of pain, actually their faith is growing. It's amazing. This happens all the time. That people go through really, really hard, painful seasons of life. And they walk through that on the other side, and their faith is actually stronger. They actually learn something more about God, and their confidence in God is greater on the other side of that injustice and that pain that was unfair. They didn't deserve it. And yet, when they walk through it, they recognize that God is present 
God is real, that his love for me is consistent and it's unwavering. It's difficult, though. It's difficult to try to look around and try to add all these pieces into the recipe and come out with an answer that we like. It's, it's a wrestling match, honestly. The difficult, part of the difficulty is we look and it's really easy to see the, the wrongness in our world, and yet we're also trying to worship this perfect God that created the world full of wrongness. It's like, well, how, how do you get these two ideas together? How do I sit in that? and allow both of these things to be happening. How do I wrap my mind around that, my brain around that? Now, here's the thing. Whenever you hear someone argue and say, well, I don't believe in God. Maybe you've said this before. That's okay. You don't need to raise your hand. But you're like, I don't believe in God because there's so much evil, because there's so much wrong. I just can't believe that there would be a good God that exists and allows that to happen. The reverse of that is that Christians, people that follow Jesus, have never made that argument as like the reason why we believe in God is because only good things happen to people that follow him. That's it's amazing. If you just put your faith in God, everything works out. There's no more pain. If you want to get rid of injustice, you just follow God. And all of a sudden, everything in your lives is made right. There's only justice. That's not, a, that's not an argument that we've ever made for the existence of God, the existence of man. Injustice in the world questions the justice of God, not the existence of God. And that's all. I, honestly, I think this is a I think this is a bigger wrestling match. I think this is a bigger tension point to think, wait, wait, wait. I mean, God is okay. God's justice is different. God's ju- what does that mean even to put that in context? That the existence of God is not actually what's being questioned, it's the justice of God when we see the injustice in the world. I kind of made this illustration a couple weeks ago, but I'm going to make it again because I feel like it fits really well. Um, if you walked up to me and you said, Andrew, I've got, I've got some problems, um, tensions with the relationship I have with my father. Um, he, he seems to be absent in conversation. Like he doesn't talk to me. He doesn't respond to me. You know, he doesn't, I ask him to do things and he doesn't do those or he does the exact opposite or you know, I, I wanted to show up to some things in my life, and he just seems to be not there. Or I ask him for my, you know, my Christmas list, and he never gets me what I ask for. Um, I, he just, he says things that hurt my feelings, and I'm not really sure, I'm not really sure what to do about all this. If I, if you had come to me and tell me, and like, we sat down at Starbucks, and you told me this whole story, at the end of that, I would not sit there and look you in the face and be like, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like your dad doesn't exist. Like, that's, that's not what I would say. I would say, wow, it sounds like you probably have uh, some communication frustrations right now. There, there's something in the middle of the conversation that you're having with your father. Like, you got to work some things out. Maybe you need to communicate differently, or maybe you need to just stop and listen and maybe see from his perspective a little. Like, there's other things. I would not say, well, it sounds like you don't have a dad. That's not what I would say. That's not the argument that I would make. Similar with this conversation that we're having today. So... Why do we assume that if there's a God, why do we assume that if there is a God, he must be good and just? Why do we assume that? That if there is a God, he must be good and just. If you're here this morning and you've been following Jesus for a while, and you read your Bible, you're like, I have some ideas. (laughs) I think think I've read something before. Yeah, let me throw a couple of those up here on the screen. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 32. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just is he. There's another verse in in the book of Psalms. It says, for the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. As Christians, we love these verses. I mean, it's just like honey. You're just like, oh, it's more. It's delicious. It's great. We embrace it. Until the moment that we're faced with injustice, we're like, wait, hold on a second. God is just, but what about my injustice that's happening? God is upright. We will see his face. It seems like I'm watching. I I don't even see him at all right now. He loves justice, but what about my justice? What about this? What about what I'm dealing with? And these verses that are so encouraging at some point in our life, other times can actually be 
like a wedge. They can actually be frustrated. They can actually like cause more anger and frustration. Like it's not working. The system that I thought I, I bought into, like that if I obeyed, that this would work out well. Like God would protect me a little bit at least. And it doesn't seem to be working. It causes frustration and anger. So where did these ideas, like for the, the authors, the writers that wrote this down, you know, David that wrote the song, where did these ideas come from that God is just, that he is good? Where do they come from? Well, they didn't come from nature. You look around nature, it's not justice, I'll tell you that much. If you watch nature, it is might makes right. It is the battle of the fittest. Whoever's the biggest and strongest, that one wins. That's not justice. It's not the ancient gods. That's not where they got these ideas and understanding. That's not where they got this perspective. The ancient gods were horrible. Like they manipulated people just to like watch them, watch them fight and cry and die. Like they didn't care at all about people. They're incredibly immoral, these ancient gods. That's not where they got the idea. Even like, like, well, maybe maybe it's like the ancient Jewish culture, Judaism. Like maybe that's where they got it. But think about this. You have this people group that God chooses. He creates. He makes his own people. And they are told from day one that they are his chosen people. If I had, we only have one kid, so that's fine, and we adopted him, so we did choose him. But, but if we have lots of kids, if you have several kids, and you tell one of them, I chose you. You know what they're going to think? Dad loves me. And everybody else, he loves everybody else too, but just a little bit less. A little bit less. Is that just? Is that justice? That's not where the example is. Islam permits God to do whatever he wants to do, and we should go along with what we see. You know, it, each individual example that we have from these different, you know, Buddhism, there's not even really a God. In Hinduism, it's like a reflection of the past, our past lives. Is a re- I don't even understand it fully, but Essentially, it's like I'm living out my karma. So if there's, if I'm dealing with injustice, it's because of what I've done before. Like each one of these doesn't actually address this idea, this understanding. Why do we have this? Where did this come from? Today we see it singularly because of Jesus. Jesus introduced the justice and dignity for all version of God. That's what we've embraced, and that comes from Jesus. Like I said, with you know the ancient Jews. They believe that God loved them just a little bit more than everybody else. Like he loved everybody, but them a little bit more. This is a difference. This is God. You know, we talked about this last week. God is love for everyone. Not just a people group, for all people. That his love is consistent. That he doesn't have favorites. All of his creation, all of his people, all of his sons and daughters. He loves them. Now, If you like this idea that God is love, if you enjoy that, you should write a thank you note for John because he wrote this down. So in 1 John, he writes this, Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Verse 8, whoever, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Like that is, that is a huge concept. God is, God is love. And if you don't, if you're not acting in love, if that's not how you live your life, he equates it to not even knowing God. That is the depth, that is the bigness, the hugeness of God's love. Now, here's the difficult thing. I think this is what we're seeing happen in our culture today. And again, this is just my opinion, so it could be completely wrong. But when you detach Christian principles from faith. When you detach these these precepts, these understandings, and detach them from faith as a whole, as in I wrestle with that there is a God, but I still like the values, but I'm going to take these values on my own and try to carry them with me without the backpack of my faith. When you do that, what ends up happening is each person ends up playing God in their own eyes. You become the ultimate authority in that instance. You know, it's like the, the the throne is vacated, and you're like, well, I mean, obviously, that's where I belong. So I'm going to sit in that seat. I'm still going to be good. I'm still going to be just because I believe in these precepts. I believe in these values. But if God is 
dismissed from the conversation, we end up sitting in that seat, in that chair, on that throne in our lives. And if that happens, if that happens, objectionable, like the objective viewpoint disappears. Everything is subjective. And if you wonder, like, if you've ever felt this, like, I wish we could just get rid of all of the injustice in the world. We just get rid of the injustice in the world. The best way to rid the world of injustice is to rid the world of God. You're like, that's a bold statement. Well, it's true. The way that you get rid of injustice essentially is to eliminate justice as a whole. Like the objective, like, oh, this is this is God's level of standard of justice. This is God's values. This is where God sits. But if we remove God, then it's it's different. Then I can decide where that line is. Then I can decide how it works in my life. And, and this is a, I mean, you get into argument about this with people if they will argue back with you. But what people are saying is absolutely true. Like, it's a little bit short-sighted, but it's true. Because people have incorrectly acted on behalf of God. Right? We've seen this in experiences. We see this in churches and church history, where people have done horrible, horrible, horrible things under the name of God, and they've ended up hurting, wounding, killing, horrible things. Right? All in the name of God. Why? Because they sat on that seat and decided what was right, what was wrong, rather than submitting to God as a whole. So, once there is no objective standard for justice, injustice ceases to exist. So, you want to get rid of injustice, you get rid of God. And honestly, we're starting to see some of these pieces in our world today. We're starting to see people choose this. This is a choice that they make. So, uh, moving on, we have once God is removed, we get the injustice list. My justice, your justice, Nazi justice, Hamas justice, majority justice, clan justice, nature's justice, street justice, rich justice, victim justice. We can go on and on and on. And each one of those seats would claim, well, this is this is what justice is. It's my justice. It, this is what justice means. And you would you would try to validate your claims and your perspective, your own worldview that's so acute and so small. But all of this leads to injustice as a whole. All of this leads to injustice when we remove God. <laughs> it, human value at this point, if that's where you're at, human value has been replaced with human opinion. <laughs> and that is so detrimental. That is so dangerous. Because we see what this does. We see how this, how this works its way into our relationships. How this works its way into our behavior. How it works its way into our values. How we treat one another. How we walk out our life as a whole. The incredible thing that happened when Jesus walked on this planet. He taught things that nobody else did. He taught things that were revolutionary, that we're still actually enjoying today, and we would fight for it today. Things like, all people have value. Whether you're a man or a woman, you still have value. That wasn't a thing that was accepted back at that time. Whether you are slave or free, intrinsic value and worth is still placed on you. Because because God created you in his image. And from that moment, you had value and worth. Not more than anybody and not less than anybody. It was holy value and worth being placed on you. Justice, though, does not come along all by itself. It has a friend that comes along with it. There is no justice without judgment. There's no justice without judgment. We can't have one without the other. If you want justice, there has to be judgment. And it's uncomfortable. We don't like it. But, but we are accountable to it. Because our knowledge of good and evil makes us accountable to the source of that knowledge. Wherever that comes from, we are accountable to that source. And, and we resist this sometimes. I, I, maybe I do. I resist it. I don't like to judge people. You know why? Because I don't like to be judged. 
So I, I say things like, well, nobody's perfect. And I say that out loud and I'm trying to like open my arms up and be embracing and like, you know, just welcome in. Nobody's perfect. But on the inside, what I'm really saying is, please don't judge me. <laughs> like, I'll not judge you if you don't judge me. Can we just both not judge each other? And that's where we sit. That's where we sit. Even, even now, though, like there's two ends of the spectrum. So some of us are clearly here like, I just don't want to judge anyone because I don't want to be judged. But that doesn't allow us to actually move forward. That doesn't allow us to actually step into the fullness of who God's created us to be. That doesn't allow us to actually strip away things that are holding us back. That keeps us in a direction where we're hurting people and hurting ourselves. Where, where we accept and embrace sin in our life. Because, you know what, I'm not going to judge you. You don't judge me. We'll just keep on going our way. Just don't correct me. I won't correct you. There's another extreme over here, though, like clear over here. And if you're in this camp this morning, if you're over here this morning, you're hoping that the rest of this morning, I'm just going to list off all the sins. Right? We're just going to talk about all the sins in the world. We're going to list them off. We're going to make sure that everybody feels it. And <laughs> not your sin, though, right? We talk about everybody else that I'm sitting with. <laughs> we just make sure that we list off everybody else's, but not, not mine. We just avoid those, just move, just bump right along somebody else's. Now here's here's a challenge that I have. And this is, it's a big one. If you feel compelled that your top priority is to make sure that everybody else is behaving, acting, doing the right thing all the time, if that's your priority, here's a hard question. When was the last time that you took a step of faith? When was the last time that you personally took a step of faith and grew? You moved in the direction of God. Because here's what I'm going to I'm going to press back on you a little bit. If you haven't been moving in the direction of God, your eyes go outward. You go out to other people and you start looking like that one's wrong, that one's wrong, that one's wrong, that one's wrong. We're not looking internally to be like, oh, I'm wrong. I, I got my stuff to deal with. And yes, God's gonna God's gonna work in other people too, but He's gotta work in me first. And if it's been a while since you've taken a step of faith, I'm I'm just gonna assume, I'm just gonna guess that it's probably your knee jerk is to judge other people, which is why we talk about this all the time. This is why we want so much our heart here at Kenyon's Church is that you would experience something in here on a Sunday morning during worship, during the conversations in the community, in small groups, in this in this church, that you would experience something that allows you, that challenges you, that moves you in the direction of taking a step of your own personal faith. We're not talking about trying to drag someone by the leash to their faith growth. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you take a step of your own. Jesus taught that God is love. And he's also just. It is the full measure of grace and truth. It's not one or the other. It's both. Grace and truth. We can't ignore one or the other. It's both of them. But before we look out, we must look in. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to make sure that we are walking this out. And I promise you, when, you're, when your whole goal is to move in the direction of Jesus, when your whole goal is to follow Jesus with your whole life, with your whole heart, you will start to see that opportunities present themselves, not for you to judge someone, but for you to actually help someone be free from their sin, from the thing. It's like it's not because you want to tell them what's wrong. It's because they recognize something is wrong. And they come to you and they say, help me. Help me. What am I supposed to do here? The conversation opens up, and you have an opportunity to bring someone forward rather than throw stones. Now, Jesus, Jesus doesn't need, he doesn't need to make a decision, like a judgment decision on you. Sometimes we feel that, we're like, what's he going to decide? Decision's already been made. Like he, he already saw, evaluated, and made the, made the choice. And he made it with his life on the cross. He knows us, that you and me, maybe me most of all, we're sinners. 
We're mistakers. We don't like sin. We don't like to say that word. We don't avoid sin. We're mistakers. We're false shorters. We're sinners. We're sinners. And we need a Savior because we can't pay that debt ourselves. We can't deal with it on our own. We need something more. Which is why God, in His perfect timing, sent His Son not to, not to point His finger at every single person, but to step up on the cross and pay for us. Simply judging is not the end. God didn't send Jesus to be like, hey, I need you to go to earth so you can judge everybody else, just tell them where they're wrong, and then come back here. That's not the end result. That was not the end of the mission. That was not the end goal. John chapter 12, verse 47. This is Jesus speaking. He says, For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He already knew. It wasn't like, uh, it's a mystery. Where are we going to find out about these people? No, no. He knows. He knows that we are guilty. That we need saving. There's this parable that Jesus teaches. If you don't know our parable, parable is a, it's a small lesson. It's an illustration. It's a story that Jesus makes up. So it's not real. Jesus just makes up this illustration. But he does so in order to make a point. He did this often. Jesus was a, a brilliant, brilliant storyteller. This particular, this particular parable, there's a poor woman, and then there's a judge that's in this kind of town and village together. And this woman, some kind of injustice has been happening to her. And she goes to the judge, and she bangs on his door. I need justice. Would you please, would you please give me justice? And he's like, I just lock, locks the door. He's like, I'm not going out there. And, and Jesus also says in the story that this judge, he does not fear God. He doesn't really care about people. So he's got it about himself. But this judge, like, avoids the woman. And he, like, goes to the movie theater, and she chases him there. And he goes to the, the restaurant, and she chases him there. And everywhere he goes, she's just following him around. Would you give me justice, justice, justice? I need justice in my life. And eventually, eventually this judge, who's not a great human being, this judge eventually is like, Phew. I guess she's not going to fight them. I guess something needs to be done. And the only thing that he can come up with is, if I don't want her to escalate, one, just be annoying and follow me around. And two, if I don't want her to actually start taking action against me, I need to actually hear her story. I need to actually listen to her case. And this is what Jesus says. If that's what this evil man does, how much more would God do? that loves you, come to your aid. And this is what, in Luke chapter 18, verse 7, Jesus speaking about this parable he just said. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off like this judge did? Next verse. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? We don't, we don't know what that justice is going to happen, when it's going to happen, what it's going to look like. We have an idea of what we want it to look like, but we don't actually know what the actual picture of justice is. But here's, here's a big question for you. If anyone, and think about this, who in the history of the world has actually the biggest argument to stop believing in God because of injustice done to him? I'm kind of setting you up. It should be pretty obvious. We're going to talk about Jesus. Jesus. Of anyone in the history of the world, he had the biggest reason to disbelieve, to unfollow God because of injustice that was done to him that he paid for with his life. It wasn't fair. It wasn't what was deserving. And yet he willingly stepped into this. The one who is the foundation of our faith was treated in his life the most unfair of all. Evil and injustice are not, are not arguments against the existence of God. They are the evidence that we need God, his mercy, and his grace. And if you genuinely, if you're here this morning and, and you feel impassioned about this, when you read the articles, when you see what's going on in the world, when you genuinely feel stirred up about injustice that you see, and I think we should, because I believe that Injustice breaks God's heart as well. And when we see this, when we see this, if you genuinely care about justice, you should hope that Christianity is real. 
that God is real. Your hope should, because this is where the hope of the world lies in a Savior, that we would receive grace and mercy, that, that God would act upon his principles of truth and grace. And it's not for us to hand those out. It's not for us to do that. Now, I know, when we look in the world, you see it, and you're like, it's not as it should be. You know, it's, like, it's like you're walking around the world like a hurricane just happened. You're like, well, that's broken, and that tree shouldn't be there, and that that's not even, I, I don't even know where that trampoline came from. Like You're just looking around the world like, this is broken, that's not right, this isn't right, that's not right. Yeah, you should recognize those things. And that's exactly, that's exactly the spot where I think this quote from C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors and theologians, comes in Mere Christianity. He writes, if I find myself, a, in, in my, or if I find in myself, excuse me, a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. It's not that it's not that the world is like just trying to put all the pieces back together and it's going to work perfectly. No, no. We were made for somewhere, something else, something more than just the brokenness that we see right now. But what does this leave us? What what are our options at this point? Where are we at? Well. You can stay looking for God to enact your justice in your timing on the world around you. And you can hope and pray that everything's going to turn right and everything's going to be wonderful and everything's going to be exactly as it should be according to you. And hope that God sees it the exact same way you do and acts in your timing on your behalf. Or you could step back and you could open your hands that God, I submit to you. Your will be done in my life. And I don't see how this works out. I don't see how it makes sense. But I'm going to trust you. Because I know the grace and the mercy that you've extended to me. So I'm just going to continue to live on the way that I know how to, and that is following you to the best of my ability. I, I do have some discussion questions for us to wrap up this morning because I do want, I, this is such a big conversation. I know, I mean, I just took a little bit of time, but a massive conversation. We could talk about this for all, all a, long, a lot of weeks. We've talked about this for a lot of weeks. But I want this conversation to continue on. First question, is the gift of free will worth the level of brokenness and choice? I think that's the first biggest question for because free will is, that's where it all comes from, right? The brokenness in this world is because we are broken. Because God decided that when he created us, he chose to allow us to not be robots so that we could choose to be in relationship with him. Because if there is no choice to be in relationship with God, then there's actually not relationship. It's just pre-programmed robot. God chose I want authentic relationship with my creation. So I'm going to give them the ability to choose to follow me and move in my direction or not to. Even, even though this other choice is going to cause pain, it's going to cause brokenness, it's going to cause hurt in their life and those around them. And for God, and this is what we wrestle with, is the gift of free will that he gave us worth the level of brokenness in the world. Next question. Are you more inclined to hope for the judgment of others or mercy to, to uh, extend it to you? I feel like this is a pretty obvious one, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you feel differently about yourself than I feel about mine. Next question. Have you asked God to remove the injustice and pain? And have you also asked God to grow you through it? This harkens back to the beginning where I said, when we try to commandeer other people's stories, that sometimes we miss out on what God's actually doing and developing in us and in them. And if you're walking through some injustice and pain right now, and it's, it's a personal thing that you're walking through right now, and you've asked God over and over and over, would you remove this? Would you remove it? Would you take this away from me? And you don't see that happening. Maybe we should start to ask God to grow us through it. God, would you be present in my life? God, would you give me the strength to endure this? God, would you give me the margin 
to help me, to help me to give the grace and mercy to those around me that I need to know. And then the last question, because we do have one more. This is actually from last week. This is just a little accountability question. Did you read the Gospel of John? And what did you learn about the Father from the Son? If you haven't done that from last week, if you weren't here last week, you didn't know about that. You still can today. It's amazing. The Bible doesn't go anywhere. It's like uh-huh. it's always on my phone. Um, it's a great place to start, though. Great place to start. Um, why don't I pray? And then uh, we're going to close up. And then next week after Thanksgiving, we'll be back for the close of the series. We need God. I'm excited for the last part. It's great. Well, my favorite one. But um, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you do. Even when we can't see it. We believe that you are at work. That we believe that you are good and just. You are full of mercy and grace. Truth. You forgive us when we don't deserve to be forgiven. And God, I I pray that as we walk through this world and as we see the injustice, we see the pain, that we wouldn't try to use that as an argument that you don't exist. But we would actually see that as the exact reason why we need you. We need you in our lives. People need you in their lives. That even when life is hard, even when life seems broken, that we can still have peace. We can still have patience. We can still have love and goodness and joy. And we can still have the gifts that you give us, even in, in spite of the circumstances that we face. God, I pray that regardless of where we're at this morning, maybe we're wrestling with this, this exact question, and maybe, maybe this is something we haven't thought of in a while. I pray that this morning, throughout this week, that we would move in your direction. We'd lean in your direction to see what, what it feels like to place our weight in a trustworthy God. Not that you'd remove our circumstances, but you'd be present with us in the midst of them. God, we love you. We thank you that you first love us. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thanks for being here with us. We'll see you next week.